the Library of Congress, I would recommend that you kind of look at that and Andrew's gonna explain how that works and how we can do things to make sure, to make sure that that, uh, that uh, record is uh, kept with as many of our stories as possible. I think Andrew had pointed out to me the one time that of all the communities that are collected in the, uh, uh, represented in the collection of the oral history projects for veterans is that Chinese is actually uh, one of the, the lesser groups. And we need to make, make sure that that's not going to be the case. But the think about that. And I also want to put another plug that the Library of Congress also keeps a record of a, a uh, stories that are collected through the um, um, uh, uh, the Story Corps program, and that's that's one where uh, we ought to think about how do we make our stories fit into that, and then uh, fill that up. But anyway, Andrew has a lot to say. He's a great person. He's ready to meet everybody, I think, and. He's wanting to get out of the uh, COVID restrictions that have been imposed. And I would recommend that if you guys are ever in Washington and the COVID restrictions are gone, you need to go see the Library of Congress and particularly the, or, the Veterans Oral History Project. It's just wonderful to be there and to see what can be done, but also be part of that historical, that place and that experience. I think is uh, uh, you, you would be impressed by what can be done and why and how it's stored there. Uh, Andrew, I hope I haven't missed said anything, <laughs> but uh, I pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Ted, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, Ted and I, we go way back. He has been just incredible helping to get the stories of Chinese American veterans in CACA in 1882, and hopefully in the future with the uh, with the new Chinese American Museum. Um, so I am a liaison specialist with the Veterans History Project. My job is to get people involved so that veterans can tell their stories so that they can be archived at the Library of Congress for future generations. Um, I am going to, let's, got a little presentation just to introduce people to the Veterans History Project. Um, what it's about, how you can participate, why it's important to participate. So we were founded in the year 2000 by a unanimous act of Congress. And the language that they wrote into law that is our mission is to collect, preserve, and make accessible the personal accounts of American war veterans so that future generations may hear directly from them and better understand their selfless service. Now that is our, that was the language that was written into law that created us. But what it means to VHP and what it means to me is that we are telling the real uncensored primary source stories of American veterans. And that's not just the sort of stuff that you'd hear from say Ken Burns or the sort of stuff that would make it into a Steven Spielberg movie. You know, we do have those stories of storming the beaches of Normandy and liberating the concentration camps um, and all of that. But that's not what we're about. What we're about is to document what it means for everyone to serve in the military. So even if you never saw combat, even if you never deployed, even if you never left the United States, it's still important that we hear your story because we're not doing this for, for entertainment. We're not doing this. Um, uh, we're, the reason we're doing this is so that there will be a lasting memory of, of the real stories of everyone who served. And you know whether that's Navajo code talkers, whether that is um, administrative roles who served stateside, whether that is um, you know fighter pilots or um, or anything else, um, whether that's a truck driver or someone who worked at the mess hall, you know we want to hear all of those stories because all of those stories are important. And it's important to note that um, these interviews are uncensored. You are free to talk about anything you want, um, whether that's good or bad. You know, we encourage you if you had a negative experience in the military, we encourage you to share that as well, because we are not doing this for propaganda. We're not doing this as a recruiting tool. We want the, the true unvarnished stories of what your service was like or what the service of veterans in your community was like um, so that people can understand, you know, a truthful, realistic interpretation of what military service is. So the way that we do that is um, via collecting oral history interviews, 
but also original correspondence created by or sent to veterans while they were in the military, along with original photographs and original artwork created by veterans while they're in the military. And finally, diaries, journals, and memoirs that were written by veterans, um, the diaries and journals, obviously, while they were in service, and then the memoirs after the fact. So the oral history interviews make up the bulk of our collections. Um, probably a good 80 to 90 percent of our collections are these one-on-one -on -one oral history interviews sitting down with a veteran. However, we absolutely love it when people donate letters and photos and artwork and diaries because a lot of the times when you're doing these oral history interviews, you're talking about events that happened 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And in the case of World War II veterans, we're now 75 years after the fact. And, you know, while people can remember, you know, fantastic stories and, and a surprising amount of detail, they're not going to remember everything 70 years after the fact, which is why these, the, you know, the letters and the diaries and the photos are so important because it's a picture of history as it was happening instead of colored through, you know, decades of, um, of the passage of time. Now, I mentioned that we need to collect the originals. We cannot accept copies. We cannot accept scans. And there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, number one is, um, you know, we are a historical record here. If you went to the Smithsonian and you thought you were looking at Betsy Ross's original flag, and it turned out there was a little note in the side that said, this is just a replica, you know, you'd feel cheated. You went to the Smithsonian to see our national history, not to see a copy. And so with us, it's the same way. Um, the other thing is also because we actually have a state-of-the-art preservation and restoration laboratory available to us, and we can um, ensure that these materials uh, get restored to and stay in pristine condition for generations to come in a way that private owners just can't. Um, so that's why we look for, uh, we ask for originals only. Uh, we do, and I know it's hard a lot of the time to part with those know, treasured keepsakes of, of your service or of service of your family members or your ancestors, um, which is why we recommend that you um, create high quality copies or scans for you to keep and then donate the originals to us. So once you actually tell your story, um, what does it look like? Well, this is exactly what it looks like. There we go. Um, so every single veteran who don't, who tells their story to us gets their own web page on our site. Um, it's got their service history. It's got a photo if they provided it. It's got um, when they served, what conflicts they served in, what units they served with. And all of this is searchable. So if you donate your story and say you worked or you served in the 406th Infantry Regiment, that means anyone who served with you can also search for that and then they can find your story, you can find their stories. And the um, it's also linked with the contributor. So if you do it on behalf of CACA, all of those stories will be linked together. So they'll in all in one place, you'll be able to see all of the stories from CACA members who donated. And in addition to the service history, of course, there's the, the materials. Um, for this one, we've got uh, the video interview. So you can click on that and it comes right up and you can listen to the whole oral history. We also have photos, those got scanned and digitized so you can watch, so you can look at those. Um, and this one also has some other material. This is a, um, a menu from Christmas in Bavaria, 1945. So there's just a wealth of, um, of these materials that's all available online. So you can easily share this with, um, with your family members, with your community members who might wanna see um, your interview or your materials. And um, it's easily accessible by content creators and uh, researchers. Uh, and we, we have tons of researchers who are using these collections. These are not just sitting on a shelf and collecting dust. Uh, at the last time we checked, um, over 850 books used us as a source, um, including uh, some popular nonfiction ones, um, but also things like textbooks. This is a textbook for um, caregivers of people with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, also, documentary filmmakers, Ken Burns used us for the Vietnam War and the war. So 
these aren't, like I said, these aren't just sitting on a shelf somewhere. These are being used by content creators, by researchers, and not just the big names like Ken Burns or, um, or Rick Atkinson. You know, young people who are considering joining the military are looking at these to see what, what it's really like before they join. Um, high school and college students are using these to write research papers. So uh, they really are being actively used every day. Um, last year, we had over 3 million researchers use our collections, both online and in person at the Library of Congress. Now, one of the reasons I'm here is that even though we have this vast repository of veteran stories, Chinese American veterans are critically underrepresented in our collections. So we rely on volunteers. We don't have uh, the staff or the funding to go out and collect these interviews ourselves. We have to rely on volunteers, whether that's uh, community organizations like CACA, congressional offices, or just someone sitting down with, with their, their mother or their father who served and, and, and talking to them and sending us the recording. That's how we get these collections. So we can't control the demographics of who donates collections to us, except through outreach programs like these. Um, and just to show you how underrepresented Chinese American veterans are, we have 110,000 collections. Of those, 436 veterans self-identified as Asian American or Pacific Islander. Now, um, they, you can also self-identify as, as specifically Chinese American, but it all because of that's the census category in our statistics, it all gets lumped together as, as AAPI. Um, that's 0.4% of our total collections. That's absolutely nothing. Um, and that's severely underrepresented, not only in our collections, but in the statistics as a whole. 3.8% of the military is Asian American or Pacific Islander. That's almost 10 times the amount of representation in the military than it is in, in the, uh, the stories that we have. And when you look at the, the rate of Asian American Pacific Islanders in the, in the US as a whole, it's even worse. So it, we absolutely have a critical need for Chinese American veterans to share their stories with us because um, you know there just aren't enough. And this is these are stories that absolutely need to be archived, that absolutely need to be told. Um, so I really do hope that that any veterans here or people who know veterans will consider um, donating a collection to us so we can do at least something to change that. So actually, before we go into the VHP interview, I'm going to play a little video. Um, there's a couple different ways to do an interview. Um, most people sit down with a family member and, and record it on uh, like a mobile device or a video camera. However, we do, um, for veterans in the DC area, we do have two interview studios at the Library of Congress where people can make appointments to come in and, and tell their story that way. Uh, we also have at the Library of Congress, we have a, um, a visitor center where some of our, um, where we display some of our collections and also provide space for um, workshops so people can learn how to interview their, um, any veterans they may know and be interested in interviewing. Um, and that is actually, that's a, we're in the process of moving that. So in a couple of months, we're going to have an awesome brand new one, but I'm just going to play a sh very short, uh, relatively short video um, that sort of introduces our visitor center and our um, interview studios. Um, as you can see, I, I trimmed my beard since then, but yes, that that is still me. Now, I'm here at the VHP Info Center in the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress. Can everybody hear this? And we have some examples of our collections lining the walls that the public can come in and see. You see, we've got things like a World War I diary from Helper John Carpenter. We have a photograph collection from Frank Aceves, who served in Vietnam. We've got emails, which count as correspondence, from Rosemarie Noel, who served as a Marine in Iraq and Afghanistan. We've got photographs from Vietnam, World War II. We've got original artwork from James Allen Scott who actually drew these while in a combat zone in the Pacific. We've got all sorts of these collections ranging from all different conflicts. Um, and of course, 
handwritten letters from World War II. This is by Kenji Ogata. Now you may have noticed that in our displays, we have Caucasian veterans, we have Hispanic veterans, we have African-American veterans, we have Japanese-American veterans. But one thing you might not have seen is Chinese-American veterans. And the reason for that is because Chinese-American veterans are severely underrepresented in our collections. That's one of the reasons I'm here today is to encourage Chinese-American veterans to tell their stories so that you can be better represented and that we can share your story with the world. One thing to keep in mind is that veterans retain all of their copyrights, their experiences and their story when donating their materials to the Veterans History Project. That means that while researchers can access your story and your materials uh, for academic purposes, they cannot use them for for-profit purposes and they will be required to get your permission before they use that for any sort of commercial purposes. It also means that you're free to use your story in any way you like. Uh, we recommend keeping a copy of your interview, and actually, if you come to us, we will give you a copy to take home with you, uh, and you can put that on your Facebook, your YouTube, share that with your friends, family, anybody that you care to, uh, to share that with. Now, speaking of, of coming to us and doing an interview with us, um, that is sort of our next topic. Um, at the Library of Congress in the Jefferson Building, we actually have a purpose-built studio overlooking the main reading room uh, where locals to Washington, D.C. can come in and conduct an interview at our location. Uh, the only thing we require for that is um, that you bring somebody with you to interview you and the required forms. Um, and I bet you're interested to see what the studio looks like, what our setup looks like. So I'm going to take you on a tour of that right now. So we are now entering the VHP recording studio, which is set up in one of the 12 alcoves that line the great reading room of the Library of Congress. You might remember the reading room and these alcoves um, from the movie National Treasure starring Nicolas Cage, which was actually filmed here on location. Now that was our entrance chamber. This is our actual recording studio. We actually have two of these set up, one on either side of the alcove, uh, both overlooking the main reading room. Uh, we do have a professional setup with uh, prosumer cameras, uh, external microphones, boom mics, and a full lighting setup to make this look as professional as possible. And of course, you've got that wonderful backdrop of the main reading room behind you. Um, so this is what it will look like when you're sitting down and telling your story. Um, I think it really is a magnificent backdrop and uh, really just a uh, appropriate and somber setting and tone for such an important historical contribution. So we would really hope for you to come in and tell your story. Um, we are happy to set up appointments once the library is taking visitors again. Um, my email is ahub at loc.gov. Um, I am happy to set up appointments uh, in advance for when we start taking uh, visitors again. Um, but also, uh, if you want to do a workshop um, explaining how to conduct interviews um, outside of the library, uh, for any uh, groups, social clubs, veterans, organizations that you might be a member of who might be interested in this. Um, so, so that's our interview space, and we'd love for you to sign up to come in and tell your story um, once we're back taking visitors. Um, and I'm, unfortunately, they haven't given us any real guidance on when that's going to happen. If I had to guess, I would say um, probably in the November to December timeframe. However, it's that's not the only way that you can tell your story. Um, and that's not the only way that you can record stories of other veterans in your community. Um, really, the program was designed to be easy to do so that anyone can sit down with a veteran with uh, equipment that they probably already have in their pocket right now, um, ask them questions, and uh, send us the recording so that we can archive it. So the uh, VHP interview has four parts. Number one, find a veteran. You probably already know one. Number two, fill out some forms. We're the government, we require forms. Uh, number three, facilitate the interview by sitting down with the veteran and asking them the actual questions while recording. And number four, finish it up by sending us the forms and the, and, uh, the media that has the recording on it. Now, any US veteran can participate. Doesn't matter if you didn't deploy, if you never saw combat, 
any U.S. veteran can participate. Um, and uh, so, and for interviewers, anyone who is 10th grade or above can be the interviewer to ask the questions. Generally, our rule says that veterans have to tell their own stories. Um, people can't tell stories on behalf of veterans. The exception to that is if the veteran um, died as a result of their service. Uh, in that case, there are gold star veteran and direct relatives, parent, spouse, sibling, or child can tell their story on their behalf. Now, normally this is where I talk about where you go to find veterans. I honestly probably don't need to even do that. You have veterans in your home, in your community, in, in CACA, um, who I'm sure would be happy to be interviewed. Um, just in case, um, I'm happy to discuss if, if you, you know, say interview somebody in your community and, and decide you really like it and want to find more veterans, I'm happy to discuss where to, where to do that. Um, and I'm going to give you my email and, and all my contact info as well. So once you've actually found a veteran, all the only other thing you need is to select your recording equipment, find a, an actual physical location for the interview, and get a VHP field kit, which has um, our required forms, our submission instructions, our rules and guidelines, and a whole set of sample interview questions. So you don't even have to make up your own questions. Now the forms are incredibly important. I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to go through these really quickly. Um, but uh, because if we don't have all the forms with the submission and filled out, we can't accept them. Number one is the biographical data form. Um, it's all of that info you saw on the website with the units you served with, the um, conflict you served in, locations you served at, along with contact info. It's important to note that this contact info will not be publicly available. We will not share this with anyone. The only reason it exists is if somebody say, you know, like Ken Burns wants to use your interview in his documentary, he would be required to get your permission before he does that. So they would reach out to us, we would reach out to you, and then get put you in contact with the person who wants to use that for a for, for profit use. Uh, and like I said, we will never give out that info. It all goes through us um, until you uh, give permission to, to give that information out. Um, the other two forms are the veterans release and the interviewers release. All this is saying is that you're giving us permission to hold on to the um, interview and to make it publicly available for nonprofit purposes. Um, I'm, uh, oh, I got a question. How do we get a copy of the VHP field kit? That's available on our website, loc.gov slash vets, or if you email me, I'm happy to send you a digital copy. Um, so. As I said in, in that short video, the veteran retains all copyrights to their story. You are not giving away any rights by signing this form. You still can use that for, you know, you can use that your story on, on your personal social media, on your YouTube. You can write a book and, and charge for it if you want. It's still your story. Uh, you're not signing away any rights. So there's a form for the veteran release and a form for the interviewer's release, which is the exact same thing except in here where it says veteran, it says interviewer. And then finally, there is the AV log, which is just as the interviewer is conducting the interview, they're writing very brief notes about the topics of conversation covered and uh, a very general sense of when in the interview it happened. Um, so in this case, enlisted after hearing about Pearl Harbor on the radio, sent to the European theater aboard the USS Geo Squire. And why this is important is because all of this also gets digitized and becomes searchable in our database. So this is how researchers find the material that they're looking for. So in this example, you can see that the researcher searched for USS Geo Squire. It popped up because it was in the notes. So it doesn't have to be a tran an exact transcript. It doesn't even have to be all that detailed. But the more detailed it is, the more searches it's going to pop up in, the better chance you're going to have of you know, researchers using this for, for a book or a movie, if, if that's what you're interested in. So once you've uh, found the veteran and filled out all the forms, it's time to um, actually sit down and do the interview. Um, it's, our rules are very simple. Um, in fact, we really only have two rules. Number one is our 30-20-10 rule, and that's if, if you're doing an oral history, it has to be at least 30 minutes long. If you're writing a memoir, it has to be at least 20 pages long, 
And if you're donating photos, letters, or pieces of original art, there have to be at least 10 of them. However, these requirements are not, um, they're, they're separate. So once you hit one of these requirements, the rest don't matter. So if you do a 30 minute interview and you wanna donate five photos, that's fine because you already um, satisfied the rule with the 30 minute interview. If you want to write a 20 page manuscript and not do any interview and not donate any photos, that's fine. You already satisfied the 20 page requirement. So you have to do one of the three, um, but once you do one of those three, you can do any combination of the rest without um, having to worry about the rule. Other than that, the only other rule is that when you send us the recording, it has to be on a CD, DVD, USB drive, mini DV tape, or cassette tape. Other than that, you are free to do things however you want. Um, you can use any recording equipment you want. Um, it doesn't matter if it's audio only. It doesn't matter if it has video. Um, most people choose to use um, tablets or cell phones these days. It's very convenient. Everyone knows how to use them. You've got one in your pocket right now. Um, but if you want to use something simpler, if you want to use and uh, you know the voice memo app on your phone, if you want to buy an inexpensive digital audio recorder off Amazon or eBay, um, or if you happen to have professional um, recording equipment, great, use that even better. But you don't have to. You can use whatever makes you most comfortable. Um, this is the what we use when we're recording in the field. It's by no means necessary, but if in case you you know, do a few of these interviews and decide that you really like it and you want to do more, or if, um, you know, you wanted to, um, if, if your organization wants to do multiple interviews, you know, this is an easy way to get very high quality um, recordings for relatively cheap. And it's just a, a tablet. It can be Apple. It can be Android, a tripod. You can get these for like 10, 15 bucks on Amazon. Um, and if you want very high quality audio, you can get these lapel mics that plug into the headphone jack. Um, but again, not required at all. This is just, this is what we use. So, um, you know, we know that this is a good way to get high quality recordings. And I'll caveat that with this. That's what we use in the field. In our interview studios, we have um, professional recording equipment. Most people choose to record with a smart or mobile device, a tablet or, or a cell phone. Um, if that is the case, just a few tips, put it on airplane mode before you start recording, get a little tripod. You don't wanna spend 30 minutes holding your phone out like that. Um, set, uh, use the highest quality recording settings that you have space for. Uh, just a quick rule of thumb, a 30 minute interview at 720p will be two gigs. At 1080p, it'll be four gigs. And at 4K, it will be a whopping 11 gigabytes per 30 minutes. So you want to make sure you've got enough storage space for the settings that you're recording on. Um, you also want to make sure you've got enough battery life. So, you know, try and have it plugged into a, a power pack or the wall if possible. And if you are recording on a modern smart device, uh, most of those record in MOV, AVI, or MP4, which is awesome. You can put those straight on a disc, straight on a flash drive, no need to convert. Uh, no need to burn to a, a DVD that'll play in a DVD player. You can just put it straight on the disc and send it to us. So nowadays, there is a big question of, you know, do you want to do this remotely or do you want to do this in person? Um, either one is totally fine. Um, don't try and read this. It's way too small. But this is a, a whole flow chart that we have that um, can help you decide whether it's better to do a remote interview or an in-person interview. And I'm happy to send you the full size version that you can actually read um, so you, to help you make those decisions. Um, there are ways to make in-person interviewing safer, um, only interview people who you already interact with, um, or you can conduct socially distanced interviews. Um, you can buy these cables that um, extend the mics up to you know, beyond six feet. Um, so that means you can be more than six feet away, but still be able to, to hear them and, and get that audio recorded. Um, but whatever you're comfortable with, whatever you feel is, is safe enough for you, you know, we want you to do um, what makes you feel comfortable. If you are recording remotely, um, it's, it's very easy, even if you've never done it before. Most of the applications have a record button right there. Um, I know Zoom, which we're on right now, has the record button right there. 
Skype, all you have to do is um, go into the settings and press start recording and it'll spit out a, a MP, MPEG-4 video file right there, usually into your um, Zoom folder, your Skype folder, or right there on the desktop. And with that, all you have to do is put it on a flash drive, send it to us with the forms, you're done. We do provide sample questions. Um, none of them are required. We just provide it to make it easier for people who have never done an oral history interview before. However, we do certainly encourage you to, to make up your own questions that are customized towards the veteran. None of the sample questions are required. None of uh, the only thing that's required in the interview is what we call the lead. And that is the veteran's name, the interviewer's name, the date and location. I like to bang it out at the very beginning of the interview. Uh, my name is Andrew Huber. I'm interviewing Ted Gong. It is August 11th, 2021. We're in Washington, DC. Ted, where'd you serve? Um, so, you know, you get uh, all that done and then you can go straight into the questions. I will say that if you go with our sample questions and you ask them, um, you know, just down the line, I can pretty much guarantee you, you will get a 30 minute acceptable interview. Um, I have interviewed even the most uncooperative veterans and, and uh, you know, they're giving yes or no answers anywhere they can and we still get our 30 minutes. Um, however, we definitely encourage you to go off script if possible, because it just makes for a, uh, a richer um, interview because uh, you know, it's not generic questions. You're tailoring these questions to the veteran. If you're able, you should schedule a non-recorded meeting um, with the veteran to discuss the interview and start to do research so you can create those custom questions if you want. Um, while you're doing the interview, um, always be looking for follow-up questions. Practice active listening. So when they're telling their story, you're not just waiting for your net turn to ask the next question. You're listening to what they're saying and you're thinking like a researcher. You're thinking like somebody who's like the person who's going to be watching this after it's submitted. And, uh, you know, if you're thinking, hmm, that's, that's really interesting what they're saying. I'd love to know more about that. Ask them, you know, have them expand on it. You know, ask those follow-up questions. The other thing is if they're asking, uh, if they're talking about things that, that perhaps you don't understand, if they're using an acronym that you don't know what that means, if they're using jargon that you don't know what that means, well, if you don't know it, other people probably won't either. So ask them, you know, make sure that this is accessible for everybody. Um, don't be afraid of silence. A lot of times, especially older veterans will be trying to, to bring back a memory that might be just out of reach. Uh, maybe they're thinking of the right words. Um, or maybe they're uh, about to talk about a traumatic event and then they need to gather up the strength to do it. So um, you know, don't feel the need to, to fill every silence with a new question, let the veteran go at their own pace. And um, this is really important. A lot of times um, veterans, the memories won't go literally from time to time and point to point. They'll be talking about one thing, it'll make them think about something else and they'll go into a whole different memory um, without explaining that they've jumped in, in time and space. So definitely try and establish um, at every important point in the story when and where it is in case it's not where it, it just was. If you are making up your own questions, good interview questions to ask, open-ended questions, questions that aren't just yes or no. Instead of asking, did you go to Vietnam? Say, describe for me how it felt when you were drafted. You know, describe for me a typical day. Um, Relationship-oriented questions, sensory-oriented questions. Uh, what, did it, what did the food taste like? Uh, one thing that struck me when I first started doing these interviews is, especially in, in Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, almost every single one of them has a detailed, visceral memory of what it felt like when they opened up that plane door and just got hit in the face with the heat and the humidity. Uh, you know, that's a, a very vivid memory that almost all the veterans I've talked to have. Um, so those sensory questions really can evoke incredible memories. Still knows what to do. So um, there are things to be aware of, um, especially when you're covering emotionally difficult topics, especially if a veteran might have um, experienced post-traumatic stress. Um, always let them go at their own pace. If they need to take a break to compose themselves, to drink some water, to get some tissues, uh, that's totally fine. You know, you can stop the interview, start it when they're feeling comfortable, um, or even if they have to wait for another day when, when they're feeling better, that's fine too. Um, a lot of times it's the opposite. They don't think they did anything. They didn't 
you know, didn't think they did anything worthy of, of having a story like this in the Library of Congress. And that's just absolutely not true. You know, like I said, we're not doing this for the Medal of Honor Saving Private Ryan stories. We have researchers in who want all sorts of things that have no relation whatsoever to combat. Um, we've had, uh, we had a corporate historian from IBM come in a while back who wanted to know about um, military pr computer programmers who program mainframes, um, who develop programming languages. Um, we've had um, logistics experts who wanted to know about the stories of Vietnam truck drivers and how they chose their routes um, so that they could um, improve supply chain logistics. So just because you think, or the veteran thinks, that what they did wasn't important, it's not true. Um, a lot of times they dealt with classified material. Uh, in that case, um, we definitely encourage you to not talk about that. I'm not qualified. Nobody at VHP has a security clearance. We're not qualified to determine what is or isn't classified. So if there is any question about it, just don't talk about it. So I am running out of time fast. Um, so I'm going to speed through the rest of these. Uh, once you finish asking the questions, you've got your 30 minutes. Uh, make sure all the forms are filled out. Make sure it recorded okay. Um, there are no errors. Um, transfer the recording to whatever media you're going to send it to uh, on, uh, whether that's a flash drive or a DVD. Try and give a copy to the veteran if possible. Then submit that media with the recording on it and the forms to us here at VHP. Um, please do not use the U.S. Postal Service. Um, USPS mail goes through an enhanced screening process that involves radiation. Um, it erases data and, and uh, it literally physically burns paper. Um, we, we don't want that, so use UPS, FedEx, anything, anything other than the U.S. Postal Service. So... Um, to find out, so um, to find out where to send those to, um, that's on our website. Um, it's it's easy. It's it's the Library of Congress's address. Um, to get a field kit, go to our website loc.gov/vets, or this right here is my email ahub@loc.gov. Um, if you want to know more, if you want interview advice, um, if you want to do a workshop like this, um, that's hopefully a little bit less rushed. Um, for any organizations or clubs that you're a part of, um, CACA chapters, anything like that, send me an email. This is my job. I love doing this. I love introducing VHP to other to new people. Um, but other than that, you know, take this, use that field kit, go out and interview the veterans in your life and your community. And with that, I have a looks like I have a couple minutes left um, to ask to answer questions if anybody has any. Uh, may I? This Please. is Suellen. Um, I have a great, a good question, and I think, uh, and thank you, first of all, for such a wonderful presentation, and uh, I think uh, we are encouraged to follow and do our uh, part here. Uh, I have a friend who has, uh, you know, uh, father's uh, collections of uh, 400 letters during the World War II time. However, these are the personal, like a, with, uh, you know, uh, his wife, um, no, then the girlfriend. So it's like love letters, more or less. And do you have any like guidelines that, or, or criteria or requirements that, uh, I know you have minimum 10, right? But the, if it's the 400, the, what is your selection process? We can submit and do you have to do an approval process? We will take we will take every single letter that you want to donate to us. There is there is no maximum. There's no selection criteria. Whatever you want to donate, as long as it was was written by a vet or to a vet, then then we will take that. And and definitely don't worry about the content. Uh, not only do we have lots of love letters, we love getting love letters. We actually did a um, an entire online feature on love letters written to and from veterans. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of sentimental. We're in the business of archiving memories. So we love things like love letters. So yes, anything, and then you don't have to donate all 400, obviously, if you wanted to curate a selection of, of 10 or more letters that you feel comfortable giving up, we'll take whatever you want to donate, whether that's 10 or 400. Great. I have Thank a you. question. Um, 
Andrew, I, um, I know that we're talking about the, the veterans and the veterans project, I understand that. But is there within the Library of Congress a more broader uh, program to record or, or histories of people that have done uh, something significant in their lives outside of um, uh, being a veteran? Uh, for example, somebody that worked on some kind of uh, project at their work, uh, you know, worked on the space program or something like that. Uh, but it was, you know, they're not a veteran. Is, is there a program for recording things like that? Yes, absolutely. In fact, so we fall, VHP falls under the American Folklife Center in the Library of Congress. The American Folklife Center actually has exactly what you're talking about. It's an occupational history, oral history program. Um, so yes, we would definitely encourage you to um, participate in that. And as Ted mentioned, StoryCorps, um, for a slightly more casual version of that, um, StoryCorps is a great way to get that story recorded. And actually StoryCorps uses us as their archive. So if they tell their story for StoryCorps, it's going to us anyway. So Andrew, this is Ted. I want to, time's running out. So thank you so much for, for your valuable insights and presentations. And I see that we have to expand this, get more, uh, some of your colleagues to talk about even the other oral history programs. But I did want to ask one quick question, uh, two actually. One is one is that I can thing that says that he has a collection of seven stories. And that raises the question, how do we donate a group of things like that? And can the CACA undertake a program, something that we might want to consider to sort of do our a gathering of stories that we can present to you as a group? So think about that. And then the other one I wanted uh, to ask you was about uh, what about people who are not veterans? Very similar to what uh, 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 was asked in the previous question is those people are on the home front. The people that worked in the, the, the factories, the spouses and the wives and these people that are in the uh, United States while the veterans are overseas. Or uh, how about the... Uh, those people that worked in the defense industry or the defense department, but who were not veterans, there were civilian employees who worked on programs like the Navy production yard and that sort of things like that. How do we capture, or can we capture all those? And again, thank you so much for being part of this program. Uh, Andrew, this is Carolyn Chan and uh, I'm a past national president of CACA and uh, helped us uh, to be a founding member of the Veterans History Project. And at the time that we were involved with VHP, we did interviews, we concentrated on World War II veterans because uh, of their age. And um, we, unfortunately, we have had some of our people pass away or we had wives who actually wanted to tell their stories for them. But uh, this particular individual I'm thinking of uh, her husband had been a World War II veteran, but he passed away without our getting his story. And she had wondered whether or not she could tell his story, at least from her viewpoint or her side of it. And uh, I guess that's one thing that we wanted to know if that is possible for someone to do that. And uh, I think we're kind of interested in now, we, we unfortunately, we are, we're, we're a small group and we had only about 38 that we turned over to the VHP back about 19, what, uh, 2013, I think, or 2011. And I know some of those have been shown. And one of those people <coughs> was Roswell, New Mexico, who had been a um, 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 prisoner of war. And uh, he actually had a, a cookbook that he has, uh, has done. And he's... Uh, now deceased, but he is, will, he, his family will be receiving the Congressional Gold Medal on his behalf. But I think we do have an interest in trying to continue this program and expand it to uh, include all of the other veterans as well. But we thank you so much for your time and coming to talk to us about it again. Uh, we kind of ran out of steam for a while. Um, we we're concentrating on other projects and uh, we think we want to revive it now. That's awesome. Yeah, I really hope we can do that. Um, I'm, I'm very excited for my work with Ted, but I'm also excited to work with anyone here who wants to, to get my help to um, get interviews in their community. Um, so I just put my email into the chat. 
uh, please, if you're interested in this, if you like this, if this it seems like something you want to do, email me and I will help you set it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for letting me be here today. Thank you, Andrew, for everything coming on. And as I, we talked, there's a lot of people who are interested in telling your stories. And especially with our World War II veterans, there's just not a lot of time left. So um, hopefully at our congressional uh, regional events, we'll help to promote this. And maybe we'll get some more stories to you. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, we're going to take a break um, until 1 o'clock. And um, so we're going to end this session and then we'll come back on at one for our next session, um, challenges and experience of the Chinese Americans in the military. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.